more heavy rain for British Columbia. The continued unsettled conditions will also hamper efforts to restore existing damage. Making climate data accessible to all. You can really explore this data and what it means for yourself, guided by all this wealth of information that's on there. It's Friday the 3rd of December and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Last month, we reported on the extreme wet weather that hit Western Canada. The beginning of winter is still looking stormy. With the latest on this and other global weather news, Aidan McGiven. Thanks, Claire. Well, yes, starting with Canada, the region is again in the firing line for more wet weather. As Weathersnap listeners may recall, two weeks ago, an event known as an atmospheric river dumped unprecedented amounts of rain across parts of British Columbia, causing flooding, landslides and sadly fatalities. On Tuesday of this week, the third of a series of powerful atmospheric rivers hit the region again, with some towns declaring a local state of emergency and ordering residents to evacuate. Snowmelt over the next few days will feed more water into already swollen rivers, leaving Vancouver and neighbouring communities at risk of further severe flooding. The continued unsettled conditions will also hamper efforts to restore existing damage to road and rail networks. Moving closer to home and parts of the Mediterranean have also been suffering the effects of heavy rain, with Malta experiencing flash flooding after a month's worth of rain fell in just a few hours. The flooding swept vehicles away and left buildings damaged. Earlier this week, Turkey was also hit by storms which caused fatalities and left many injured by flooding and falling debris. More heavy rain is forecast for much of the Mediterranean and Southeast Europe over the next few days. Italy, Greece and Turkey face a renewed risk of flooding, together with hail and lightning in places, with areas at higher elevations facing the risk of heavy snow and blizzards. Finally, this year's hurricane season has officially drawn to a close. The 2021 season has been remarkable, not least for exhausting every single storm name on the list. This also happened last year, and it's the first time the naming process has used up all the names two years running. According to the National Hurricane Centre, the Atlantic hurricane season produced 21 named storms with winds of 39 miles per hour or greater, including seven hurricanes with winds of 74 miles per hour or greater. And four were major hurricanes. That's Grace, Ida, Larry and Sam. Ada McGiven. As all parts of society strive to meet their net zero commitments, making climate data accessible and easy to understand is more important than ever. Graham Madge spoke to Professor Peter Stott on how the Met Office is doing this. This is the first time we've pulled together all this information in this way at the Met Office into this portal. And one of the great things about this is that you can you can look at these graphs, but then you can go and discover much more. You can go and find out about all these different indicators of climate and how they're measured and what they mean. You can even go and get the numbers and look at the data for yourself and, and really explore this data and what it means for yourself, guided by all this wealth of information that's on there. Many of our listeners will be familiar with the fact that temperatures are rising in the atmosphere. But my eye was drawn to the amount of emphasis being given to ocean heat content. Why is that important? Well, when you think about climate change, we've not just got to think about the temperatures in the atmosphere, uh, the temperatures you measure at weather stations, because actually the heat that's trapped through the enhanced greenhouse effect that's the result of our emissions of greenhouse gases, over 90% of that is going into warming up seawater. So the main indicator of climate change is the changing temperature of the oceans. And that ocean warming, which you're seeing demonstrated very graphically in this climate dashboard and you can go and explore, is a really important, probably the most important indicator of the fact that our climate is changing, is warming up. Peter, you've spent a lifetime studying the relationship between extreme weather and climate change. Which of these indicators causes you the most sleepless nights when you look at them? The indicator of most particular concern to me relates to the work that I do actually on looking at how extreme weather events are changing 
One of the really fascinating things about the climate dashboards is that you can delve into different aspects. And one of the aspects is to do with extremes. It's to do with the warmest, hottest temperatures in a particular year, and also to do with the heaviest rainfall events. So how much rain is falling when we get the strongest rainfall, the strongest storms. And we're seeing very clear trends in those as well as in the mean temperatures. So it's these extremes that are changing and it's the fact that they are changing not just in one place or you know it's not just changing in the UK. We've seen quite a number of, of floods for example in the UK recently but they're changing around the world. And so it's those extremes because it's the extremes in particular that have an impact in terms of flooding people's homes, in terms of affecting vulnerable people in heat waves, the winds, the very strong winds in storms. So that's the one that gives me the most concern. Now, scientists and politicians have spent a couple of weeks in Glasgow trying to think about ways of bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. If there's fruit coming from Glasgow, what will we see in these indicators? Because surely we should see climate change responding Yes, so these data will be continually updated. So every month you'll see the latest information. And these are an extraordinary collection of measurements made all around the world. So not just the weather stations, but the buoys that are going through the ocean into the depths, satellite data, extraordinary amount of information that's been compiled. We should see climate responding to measures to reduce our emissions. So what we'll be looking for, what, what we'll be very much looking for as, as scientists and of course you yourself can go in and the listeners, you know, you can go in and have a look yourselves in this. But what we'll all be looking for is a sign that those trends are starting to change. And this will be quite, uh, initially, this may be quite tricky to, to actually figure out because there are very clear trends, but even above that, there's a little bit of variation from year to year over and above the fact that things are steadily changing. So the things that I will be looking out for in particular will be the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you can go into the dashboard and look at that and to see whether the year by year increase is starting to level off and I'll also be looking at the warming of the ocean and I'll be looking to see whether the warming of the ocean again is starting to show initial signs of starting to level off which we need it to do if we really do have the strong evidence that things are starting to change. So some of these graphs show quite long-term trends what happens if we get a cold winter? Does that mean that climate change is over? Will we see that reflected in the grass? You will actually see it reflected in the grass, but to a really rather small extent, in fact. So a cold winter in one particular place, like the UK, there'll be warmer temperatures in other places. And so the global average will be varying much less than in a particular place. But even so, if you look at the dashboard, you will see, for example, that global temperatures some years are warmer than others, and there'll be one or two years in there that are cooler. Now, that does not mean that global warming has stopped, because, again, you can see for yourself that if you look over several decades, you can see a very clear trend in how the temperatures are varying. And, in fact, if you then go and look at the, the warming of the ocean, the ocean heat content, you'll see, actually, that that graph is much smoother. And that's a reflection of the fact that that is the in many ways the best measure of how climate is changing, the actual huge amount of heat that's going into warming up the world's oceans. Professor Peter Stott. For more details on the climate dashboards, check out the Met Office website. And now here's Alex Deacon with the weather for the next few days. The weather continues to keep us on our toes. The weekend, first of all, it's going to turn colder again with a mixture of sunshine and showers on Saturday. Now, although it's turning colder, the showers will chiefly be of rain, but some snow is likely over the hills of Scotland, particularly the southern uplands, and also across the Pennines at times there could be some snow. But as I said, most of the showers at low levels will be of rain, and there'll be some good spells of sunshine, especially on Saturday afternoon, so across the southeast of England, but also the central belt of Scotland. Elsewhere, you will be dodging the downpours and feeling chilly again. It's going to be cold on Saturday nights. Sunday is kind of an east-west split with low pressure in the North Sea dragging in more showers down the eastern side. So eastern England in particular continuing to see some showers. Again, a bit of snow on the hills, so the North York Moors, for example. But further west, many places on Sunday, dry and fine with a good deal of sunshine thanks to a little ridge of high pressure. Going to turn cold on Sunday evening and then we've got a, a weather front coming in from the west. And as that hits the colder air, 
there could, for a time, be a little bit more snow on Sunday night and into Monday morning. Again, mostly over hills, northern England and parts of Scotland. Then things get tasty out in the Atlantic, an energized jet stream powering out from the eastern seaboard of the United States is likely to pick up an area of low pressure and really generate it into a deep area of low pressure. We are talking uh, a weather bomb here as it drops a lot of uh, isobars in 12 to 24 hours during Sunday and into Monday night. By the time it arrives in the UK, probably on Tuesday, it won't be perhaps as intense, but we are still expecting a spell of very windy weather Tuesday and Wednesday across the UK. Uncertainty about the exact depth, the exact timing. This isn't a repeat of Storm Arwen. It's in a different place, so different effects uh, will be seen. But nevertheless, the potential for a very windy spell through the middle of next week. So keep up to date with the forecasts. Thanks, Alex. Now Martin Bowles has last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning Monday the 22nd of November and ending Sunday the 28th of November. The highest temperature of the week was 11.7 degrees Celsius at Skelton in southwest Wales. The lowest temperature was on Sunday when minus 6.4 Celsius was measured at Shap in Cumbria following widespread snowfall in that area brought by Storm Arwen. The largest daily rainfall total was 32.4 mm at a Boyne in Aberdeenshire on Friday. And the greatest daily sunshine was 7.9 hours at Exeter Airport in Devon on Monday. We don't normally report wind extremes on weather snap, but Storm Arwen brought some truly remarkable wind gusts on Friday night into Saturday in eastern Scotland and northeast England. A rare Met Office red wind warning had been issued for those areas. Not counting mountaintop sites, the highest officially recorded wind speed was a gust of 85 knots at Brizzly Wood in Northumbria just after midnight. That converts to a whopping 98 miles per hour. Thanks, Martin. That's it for this week's Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.